Welcome to Focus on Your Health, your radio home for news and stories from Kingman Regional Medical Center here on the KJAZZ Radio Network. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and joining me this week is Kathleen Burns, pediatric nurse practitioner at Joshua Tree Pediatrics. Hey, Kathleen. Welcome back. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, We have a big list of stuff that we're going to talk about. I thought it would be fun to do the Frequently Asked Questions episode. Absolutely. I think that we get a lot of frequently asked questions, and it would be a great topic. Okay, very mm-hmm. cool. So you've compiled, you were gracious enough to compile a list of some of the things you hear all the time. Mm-hmm. So let's tackle some of that. Um, the top of the list is poop. <laughs> Should you want to start with poop? <laughs> Absolutely. I okay. think that um, you know parents are very concerned about their children if there's any change in their bowel habits. And we get a lot of questions about diarrhea and constipation and frequency and color. And so I think, you know, when we get questions like that, one of the first things we say, or I ask is, you know, what has the child been eating? Mm-hmm. A lot of times we want to start with something very basic don't, you know, jump to a conclusion that they have some rare bacterial disease. It could just be a change in diet that has caused some type of diarrhea. A lot of times they'll have been on antibiotics Mm -hmm. and antibiotics, as we know, can cause antibiotic associated diarrhea. Uh, We did cover that before. We did cover that. (laughs) A bigger question that I get is what about constipation? Because children have very small intestinal tracts and any changes often will be reflected in their their bowel movements. Okay. And um, we do have a diet that's very highly processed mm. and lots of sugar. And children, you know, once you start offering children foods like that that are sweet and fatty, they prefer not to have fresh fruits and vegetables. But if we give them fresh fruits and vegetables right away um, and they don't know the bad foods, uh-huh. um, they'll, they'll choose those foods. So, you know, the first thing I'll uh, tell a parent is, you know, how often are they going to the bathroom? Right. Or ask a parent how often are they going to the bathroom? Well, what is normal? Uh, mm-hmm. it, should it be once a day or? Well, it more than that, it should be consistency. Okay. So there's actually, I even have a chart of consistency yeah. of, of stool patterns. Okay. And, you know, it should be soft, comfortable, and easy for the child to, to go to the bathroom. Even if they go every two days, as long as it's soft and comfortable, that's not considered constipation. They don't okay. normally have to go every day. But they could go twice a day, and if it's really formed and hard and uncomfortable, especially for children that are toilet training, right. that will deter them from toilet training if the stool is really hard. So what I first say is how much water have they been drinking? So we, we start there. And then we talk about what foods they've been having. Um, and, you know, most of the time just adding fiber or prunes or prune juice um, will help a child move their bowels. If they're still having trouble after that, I've been recommending probiotics. And yeah. we've, we're seeing in our practice, I think we're seeing a big difference in, in bowel movements. And especially parents reporting that children that have been constipated for long periods of time are suddenly having regular bowel movements because we're actually making good bacteria to help them, you know, digest and and the food and move things along. So it's pretty common for you to get questions about bowel movements that are really within the scope of being normal. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And so then what are the things that you're looking for that you say, well, now that's outside of the realm of normal. Here's what we need. Yeah. If a parent reports that a child has blood in their stool, if they have mucus in their stool, if they have chronic diarrhea, you know, four or five, six diarrheal stools a day, then Mm. that's when we start to get concerned, especially if they have a high fever. Um, Generally, children, if they have a bug, a stomach bug, they'll have vomiting for one or two days. And then usually as the bacteria moves through their their system, they'll have diarrhea for four or five days. And the biggest thing with that is um, hydration. You just want to make sure that they're drinking lots of fluids. The other thing to think about, too, is that when they're, you're giving them things for rehydration, you don't want to give them sugary things. You want to mostly water. They've studies have shown that water works almost as well as Pedialyte. And avoiding dairy is a big thing. That helps a lot because when we have a, a GI bug, we kill the enzymes that digest dairy. And so if you're introducing dairy too soon, your body just won't digest it and you're going to have more diarrhea, especially for people that have lactose intolerance. Now, if I called you and said, my kid's had diarrhea for a couple of days, mm-hmm. do you is that a trip to the clinic? Do you want to see him, or is it something we can manage at home? Yeah, it's usually something we can manage at home. Um, two or three days, it's not a big deal, unless I 
it is bloody. Um, a lot of times if a child has had hard stools, um, they could have some blood in their stool, but it would be bright red streaks um, sometimes. Yeah. Um, if it's dark, dark, black, tarry stool, that's when we get really concerned because that means they might have some internal um, process going or bleeding going on. So uh, okay. that's why I get concerned. But most of the time we can handle it home. Right. Um, if it continues, we'll do a stool sample to make sure that they don't have any issues or bacteria or ova or parasites that are causing the, the diarrhea. Okay. Let's move upstream a little bit. I know you get a lot of questions about the stomach. Mm -hmm. What are some of the frequently asked questions you, you get about that? Abdominal pain is probably one of the biggest complaints in any pediatric office. Okay. Um, generally, I'll start out with how long does it last? How extreme is it? Do they have a fever? You want to rule out some type of pathology. Do they have an appendicitis? You know, is there something that's caused surgical that's causing the pain? Um, once we rule that out, sometimes they'll need, you know, imaging, but I can generally tell when a child is in severe pain yeah. um, that they need urgent treatment. A lot of times it is a food intolerance. Many times it's constipation. I'd say most of the time that we have abdominal pain in our office, it's constipation. Mm -hmm. And we can do a simple x-ray to see how full the bowel is with stool and then do an evacuation. Usually the abdominal pain subsides. Often children may be dehydrated and that causes abdominal pain also and, and constipation. So we want to make sure that they're really well hydrated and drinking water and not soda and sugary beverages. If a kid is really backed up, what is the uh, course of treatment for that? I like magnesium citrate. You can usually clear a child out pretty quickly with that and it's very safe. Um, you want to probably start from the top and work your way through. If you use a suppository, it only usually cleans out the bottom portion. Right. You know, prune juice works very well. The peas work very well. <laughs> Pears and prunes and peaches and plums work very well uh -huh. to clean up the digestive tract. And what are some of the questions you get related to children's diets? I think uh, the most common question is related to how do I get my child to eat? They're picky eaters. And they especially become picky eaters when we start offering them foods that are high in fat, high in salt, mm -hmm. high in sugar. Um, and all of a sudden they choose those foods over foods that are, that are, you know, natural and, real and, foods, good, and yeah. real good. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of parents feel that they'll starve to death if they don't <laughs> feed them a French fry, uh -huh. even a French fry. If I can just get them to eat a French fry or a chicken nugget, then we're doing something. Um, so what I usually suggest, because you just can't go cold turkey, is offering them three foods two foods that they like, and one food that's new and have them try it. And every meal, keep introducing one new food. And, and most parents report and studies show that the child will start choosing some new foods and they'll yeah. eventually develop a palate for it. Yeah. The other thing I always recommend is to make sure that the family has one meal together. It's very important. There's, there's a, a really good study out that showed that even just one meal together eaten as a family, helps reduce obesity, it helps improve scores and um, performance in school, mm -hmm. and also just a sense of bonding within the family. Yeah. So, and getting children involved in that meal making and not make it rushed, that also show, has been shown to help children um, develop a palate or a different palate for different foods. It's oh. probably some part of that is modeling that behavior yes. where you think, okay, He's not going to eat broccoli tonight, mm -hmm. but we're going to eat it. And eventually, if we stay with it, he may come join the dark side and have some broccoli with us. Yeah, and you can get clever, too. You can hide vegetables in lots of things. <laughs> um, I usually, you know, one of the easiest things to do is steam a few vegetables and then puree them in a tomato sauce. And if the kid likes pasta, then mix it with pasta. And, right. and a lot of times they'll eat it that way. Right. A lot of times it's texture issues, too. So you have to make sure that they like the texture. They will eat. They do go through growth spurts where they'll eat nonstop for a couple of days and then they don't have an appetite. So I, I let parents know that they'll go up and down with their appetites, especially as they're growing and through growth spurts. So now if you have a parent who's kind of gotten into this problem where the kid wants fries and nothing else, mm -hmm. would you say that a parent should say for tonight, that's fine, go hungry? Well, I would say let's give them choices. Children like choices because they like to be in control. Sure. So yes, you can we're not having french fries tonight, but you can have sweet potato fries or you can have a baked potato. 
Okay. And then that gives them some sense of control over right. the whole situation. And if they don't like that choice, then, you know, um, I know everybody, we, we used to go to bed hungry, but I think yeah, that, yeah. you know, sometimes children will get hungry and they will come around. Yeah. It's a battle of the wills, though. I know they can be very stubborn. If the choices don't work and it comes to that, then well, fine. Let the kid make that choice or... Yes, what do you th- absolutely. Yeah. Kid won't croak over. They're not going to croak, no. Yeah. I mean, if they have a serious issue, that's a different... Sure, yeah. Different, you know, if they have a, a severe weight loss, that's a different issue. Sure. But if they're normally healthy children... Yeah, and they're testing you. They will come you. around, they're testing you. Right. Yeah. They have strong wills. (laughs) It's time for a quick break on Focus on Your Health. We'll return in just a moment with the rest of my conversation with Kathleen Burns. This is the KJAZZ Radio Network. Riders on the storm Riders on the storm Into this house we're born Into this world we're thrown Like a dog without a bone And actor out alone Riders on the storm there's a killer on the road. His brain is squirming like a toad. And welcome back to Focus on Your Health here on the KJAZZ Radio Network. This week I'm speaking with Kathleen Burns, pediatric nurse practitioner at Joshua Tree Pediatrics. You also get a lot of questions about fever. I do. (laughs) I think that's the parent's worst fear. Uh And oftentimes I will have a parent say they had a high fever and I'll ask them what it was. And they'll say, well, I didn't take the temperature, but I, they felt really, really warm. Mm-hmm. So it's really important to have a thermometer. It should be your basic tool as a parent. Mm-hmm. And if they feel warm, then take their temperature. And a lot of times it's normal. They might be overheated. They could be dressed too warmly. We consider a temperature over 100.4 degrees wow. okay. Fahrenheit. The fever itself is not a bad thing. I think that parents get more upset about a fever than they do what's causing the fever. Okay. The fever is our body's immune system heating itself up to get the white blood cells and all the other immune modulators to where they're supposed to be. So often um, I'll say to a parent, you take their temperature. If it's low grade and the child seems fine, I don't recommend Tylenol or, or Motrin. And they don't have to get the fever down. Just let it run its course in that Just case? Just let it run its course, unless the child's miserable mm-hmm. and Tylenol doesn't help or Motrin helps them feel better. The studies are up and down about how long it'll last. Usually, right. um, we do get concerned if a fever lasts over three days, three to four days in a child, then there's usually something more serious going on. Or if a small infant under two months has a fever, okay. then there could be some something going on. So in those instances, they should be seen right away. What's the highest fever you've ever heard of? Oh, it can go up to 105, 106. Okay. Now, is that particularly scary or is that basically the same deal as is 102 versus 105? The degree of the temperature doesn't matter as much. Okay. At higher temperatures, if a child may be prone to febrile seizures, mm-hmm. if a child has a febrile seizure, that doesn't mean that they're going to have seizures for a long period of time in their life. Um, so in the, that instance, if we know a child has febrile seizures, absolutely, we want to bring it down and give them Tylenol or Motrin. Right. Aside from seizures, are there any particular dangers with a really high fever? And I ask that because I think there's this idea that uh, if the kid's fever hits 105, his brain is going to cook. No, they've shown that <laughs> that's, not, that's not true, even though I know children seem very, very sick. Parents are often more concerned because it's so high and their child doesn't feel well. Yeah. And it's not necessarily the fever. It's just that the child feels really sick. Um, but that's the way the immune system will kick in and really help fight the infection. Okay. And children's immune systems are so pristine when they're young that the fever really helps them fight the infection. Right. 
the, the systems haven't been pickled by 30 years of alcohol and cigarettes. <laughs> exactly. And, <laughs> and chemicals and everything else we put into them. Sure, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, do you recommend any sort of external cooling for a kid with a high fever? Just dress them lightly yeah. and make them comfortable. But if they have the chills, you want to make sure that you're covering them up. And yeah. I, I think that, you know, an ice bath is probably the worst thing you can do okay. for a child when they're really, really sick. Yeah. So it makes them so uncomfortable. But, you know, cool washcloths and that type of thing. But yeah. in the old days, I used to submerge them in a... <laughs> Um, ice, you know, tub, and yeah. that was so traumatic. They did a and, lot of things in the old days. <laughs> yes, <didn't>? they did. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the skin. Yes, it's a very, it's the largest organ in the body, yeah. and we get many questions about the skin. And one of the most frequent um, office visits is for us to look at a rash, and. I will tell a parent also that I really can't diagnose it over the phone because a lot of parents call with questions related to a rash, and it's yeah. very hard to yeah. to see the skin over the phone. <laughs> and so I we will usually bring them in. It's very common, especially in younger children that have been sick. Let's say they've had a fever, runny nose for two or three days, and then they break out in a rash all over. Um, it's called a viral exanthem, and it's from a virus. And when the parent sees the rash, it's it's pretty scary Mm -hmm. um, because it's generalized. But usually by that point, the child is acting fine. They're happy. They're back to their normal selves. And it it means that the virus has resolved. Okay. Um, So that's called a viral exanthem. And usually at that point, they're not contagious. Right now, we're seeing a lot of bug bites and um, rashes. I'm from the East Coast, so we saw a lot of poison ivy and tick bites. Oh, sure, yeah. But here we see more um, insect bites. Uh Um, So those are usually treated the same way unless a child has a tendency to have a severe allergic reaction, like an anaphylactic reaction, of course. But most of the time they're treated the same way. Which is? Some type of antihistamine, just just to get rid of the itching. Um, And then, you know, cool compresses and sometimes an over-the-counter a steroid okay. if it's really you know bad we'll give them a stronger steroid for a short period of time um hives we get a lot of questions about hives uh, urticaria is the other word for hives okay and that particular rash is very very difficult to determine what caused it and the treatment is usually the same um we'll recommend often you know did they have a new food did they have new detergents did they have anything new that they've been exposed to and unless you're keeping a real tight journal, it's very difficult. If it continues, we'll often do an allergy and immunity referral to see if there is a particular cause for the hives. But most of the time, it's treated the same. Okay. Antibiotics can also cause a reaction, urticarial reaction, so we watch for that too. You also get a lot of questions about eczema. Yes, eczema. And generally, it goes with eczema and allergies or something like rhinitis or asthma. But it's generally eczema is dry skin, um, and certain and it's hereditary, and certain children have a bigger predisposition for it. What we usually recommend for that is to have great hydration. So maybe bathing every day, moisturize with an unscented lotion cream, and then if it's itchy, you know we'll recommend a hydrocortisone cream. Also, it does run in families. Um, often children with eczema have allergies and asthma. So we'll also look at that and treat that if it's necessary. Dairy can play a big part in eczema. Breastfed babies have a lower incidence of eczema Hmm. and allergies that they're showing now. So that's so important. Also, if you have a family history of eczema that the mother tries to breastfeed for at least a year. Breastfed babies seem to do better in basically every respect. They do. Another area that they do really well in breastfed babies anyway, is preventing ear infections. Uh They've shown that one way to prevent ear infections is to at least, if you can, breastfeed the baby for at least 12 months. And I've seen that in our practice that children that are breastfed come in less for ear infections because it builds the immune system. Now, Kathleen, I know you joined us, uh, what's well, been not quite a year, right? Ten months ago. So this I is moved your, to Kingman. Mm-hmm. That's right. This is your first summer here. It is. So put on your headphones. We're going to go for a little walk in the rain. Excellent. This is from a little bit earlier in the summer. And when these massive storms hit town, um, 
it's, it's you've seen it, right? It's, I've experienced it. It's, it's amazing. It mm-hmm. is an amazing storm, and then the water comes from all the high ground and rushes down, and it seems to all end up in that park at the intersection of eastern and southern. Now, uh, the longtime locals refer to that little park as the Green Hole. Yes. I just learned that. Uh Uh-huh. And I understand that this summer you also saw what happens when that hole gets flooded. Yeah. Yeah. It was... (laughs) I'll be honest. It was very disturbing (laughs) to see children swimming in there. I know they were having fun, and I know it was a great time. Yeah. But all I could think about was all the storm, the runoff that was coming from down the hill (laughs) that was full of feces possibly, urine Uh, from some of the animals, uh, um, different chemicals. That area, too, is probably sprayed with all kinds of pesticides. Dogs do their doo-doo there, their business, and horses from up further on the the, uh, hill. (laughs) If you're listening to this outside of Kingman, this is really something to behold, this park. It's, I don't know, maybe I'd compare it to about a football field. And uh, I don't know, probably after a big storm, the water could be three feet deep. Three, three or four feet I, deep. I mean, four feet, maybe, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, after that storm, I loaded up the radio gear and I went down to the park. And the water comes rushing so hard down the mountain that what you're hearing now is actually the sound of water racing into the park. And as is custom, now that the storm is cleared and the water's rushing in, uh, people from all over the neighborhood come and trucks pull up and kids run out and they've got their floaties. And um, this particular night, there was a boat out (laughs) in the park. It did look exciting. Yeah, it does look like fun. And and looked like a lot of fun, but I couldn't help but to think about all the bacteria and viruses. And You're not going to spoil present. the fun, though. No, 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 no. Okay, yeah, you will spoil the fun. Are you telling me there are some potential health risks here? There are. Um, one I can think of in particular is leptospirosis, which okay. is a spirochete, which is a type of bacteria that um, is found in contaminated urine. We don't see it too much in this country, but there is the potential for that to happen. And what happens is the urine becomes infected, and then it goes into the water, groundwater. And in this case, it would rush down the hill and go into the (laughs) The the green green hole. hole. (laughs) And if a child has a cut on their foot or any open area, they can come in contact with this. And it can be pretty serious. Some of the side effects are high fever, headache, chills, muscle aches, vomiting, jaundice. Oh, dear abdominal pain so you know it's one thing to keep in mind when the children especially are playing with their skin exposed right. um, in that area absolutely it, it has a potential to to affect kids this is the part of this that bothers me because it looks like so much fun <laughs> i know it's any kid's <laughs> dream to have the park you usually play in suddenly filled with water you have a huge swimming pool what's yeah. there not to love about that? and i'm sure they're m- most of the children are pretty happy and <laughs> healthy yeah. after they've experienced this but as a healthcare practitioner i can't help but think about <laughs> all the the hazards that it might cause is part of being a healthcare practitioner just ruining everybody's good time <laughs> thank you <laughs> Yeah. That's Kathleen Burns, pediatric nurse practitioner at Joshua Tree Pediatrics. You can reach her office at 928-681-8706. That's 681-8706. And that's this week's show. I'm T.G. Lafredo. Thanks for listening. Please join me again next Saturday at 11.30 a.m. for another edition of Focus on Your Health, right here on the KJAZZ Radio Network. You are a very loud laugher? Uh I am a loud laugher. Ha, ha, ha. (laughs) (laughs) See, that, for example, may be the stinger on this show. Uh Uh-huh.